Hello, and welcome to A Daily Walk, where you never have to walk alone. You can be sure even the most godly Christians will go through trials and storms. It's not always linked to wrongdoing or because God is somehow displeased with us. With that said, there are some storms that are unnecessary and we create. Today, Pastor John Randall speaks about that and reveals how we get into that sort of a storm and how we can get out. We'll meet you in Acts 27. If you'd open up your Bibles with me now to the book of Acts, chapter 27 this morning. Acts chapter 27, with a message entitled, A Storm is Coming. Acts chapter 27, I want to draw your attention to the first verse, Acts chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners to one named Julius. He was a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of a dramatium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Father, we pray now that you would speak to us through your word, We thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Found within the pages of Scripture are several accounts of those who encountered severe storms. One of the most notable storms came in the form of a worldwide flood of judgment that is recorded in the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us at that time that the heart of man was evil continually and violence covered the earth. Yet a man named Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he began to build an ark. It was following the completion of that 120-year building project that Noah and his family and two of every animal went inside the ark, and God closed the door, and the entire earth was flooded. But another storm recorded in the Bible is found in the book of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet who was given a command by God to go and warn the people of Nineveh to repent or to be judged. Jonah resisted, and he ran from the call of God in the opposite direction, assuming that he could hide. But the Bible says that the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and a mighty tempest so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then Jonah was thrown overboard, swallowed by a great fish, and three days later, vomited up on the shores of Nineveh. When you come to the New Testament, you read about a storm that the disciples countered on the Sea of Galilee. Often we think of storms in the Bible, we use them as pictures of storms in life that we encounter. And the truth is, every person will face trial-like storms in this life. The scripture says that the rain falls on the just and upon the unjust. And although you're seeking the Lord and serving the Lord, it doesn't make us exempt from adversity. But what I'd like for us to consider this morning in Acts 27 are storms that can be avoided. I'm talking about trials that we create because we are unwilling to listen to the Lord or the storms that we face because we choose, like Jonah, to go in the opposite direction of the Lord. I want to point out to you this morning how a person gets into a storm, but more importantly, how you get out of it. At this point in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul had been placed within the judicial system of Rome for crimes that he did not commit. And having been falsely accused, He was taken to stand trial before the court in Rome because Paul knew that he wasn't going to get a fair trial. And so he exercised his right as a free Roman citizen to appeal to the highest court in the land by appealing to Caesar. And because of his appeal, the governor at that time was obligated to send Paul to Rome, which guaranteed his travel arrangements and his safe arrival. But as you continue on in the journey, you come to find out that there were some concerns. Paul was placed on a ship with a number of prisoners. 
He was put under the care of a centurion named Julius. Paul's friends, Aristarchus and Dr. Luke, who is writing this account, details the historic voyage. And as they set sail, it started out rather uneventful. Luke records the different stops that they made along the way. They stopped in a place called Sidon. While the ship was in port, Paul was given favor to go and visit his friends in the area. But when they got back on the ship to continue their journey to Rome, there were a number of concerns that became apparent. Look at verse 4. When we had put to sea, from there we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There a centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. Verse 7, and when we had sailed slowly for many days and arrived with difficulty off Sinindus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of the Crete of Salome. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lacia. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast being already over. Folks, listen, as the ship continued to move forward due to the conditions, it was unable to take a direct route. Instead, they were forced to travel northeast of Cyprus and northward of the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia. And then slowly, it says, they made their way to the port of Myra. And the reason for the redirection, listen, it was because the winds were contrary. So a decision had to be made. Rather than continue on a smaller vessel, they decided to get onto a larger ship. And so they boarded a ship from Egypt to Italy, carrying valuable cargo of grain. And from there, they sailed slowly westward with 276 passengers, about 100 miles. But the winds, it says, grew stronger and more difficult, hindering their ability to continue. Then they turned southward toward the island of Crete, sailing around the Cape Salome, to the eastern port of the island and anchored in a place called Fair Havens. Here's where I want you to pay attention. Listen carefully because you could be headed for a storm this morning. The person that will find themselves in an unnecessary storm or the person that creates their own trial, number one, is the person that does not discern the signs of the coming storm. Look at what it says in verse 4, the winds were contrary. Verse 7, arrived with difficulty. Verse 8, difficulty. Verse 9, much time had been spent. Verse 9, sailing was dangerous. You get the idea? This isn't going to end well. This is worse than Gilligan's Island. This is not a good thing that's happening here. And I believe that before you ever fall into temptation, before you ever stumble into some besetting sin, Before you step into a trial that you may be creating, the Lord is so faithful to give us warnings in advance. Perhaps a faithful friend comes alongside of us, cares enough about us to tell us the truth. Or maybe it's a gentle reminder from a sermon like today. Or a lack of peace within your heart when something that you're being asked to do goes directly against what you believe, what your convictions are, and it doesn't sit well with you. Friends, these are warnings from the Lord. It's like a flare being shot up into the sky, illuminating the darkness of the situation and giving us a warning. Or it's like a roadblock informing us that we need to exit. Or a red flag unfurling in our face the moment that person spoke to us or the opportunity presented itself you knew something's not right. And yet that person who disregards and doesn't discern the signs, overlooks them, explains them away, or justifies their actions, and they are in danger of falling. They're not discerning the signs of the storms. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, he who is often rebuked hardens his heart, will suddenly be destroyed, and 
that without remedy. How many of God's servants recorded in Scripture fell into sin, stumbled along the way, but they were warned in advance? Samson, David, Solomon, Peter, the list goes on. Let me ask you this morning, is there anything right now that the Lord is forewarning you about that you're still considering? Maybe a relationship at the office or a questionable decision financially or even a biblical compromise at this moment. Whatever it might be, the Lord is saying, stop now before it's too late. Maybe it's creating difficulty or controversy. This is dangerous. It's important to observe the signs and be wise and be warned. Oh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 22 verse 3 that a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Paul's journey had begun, but listen, it now continues. It says in verse 9, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous, Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo of the ship, but for our own lives. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken of by Paul. As the ship was now safely docked in the harbor of Fair Havens, the Roman centurion, along with the ship's captain, began to make plans to set sail. But Paul spoke up and he gave a warning. He advised the sailors to remain where they were for the winter. These were dangerous seas, especially during September through November. Paul felt that if they continued, there would be disaster, there would be damage, and even potentially death. This was the warning given by the Apostle Paul. Oh, but this brings us to the second point, friend. The person who ends up in an unnecessary storm not only does not discern the signs, but they disregard the warnings. At this point, Paul had already written his letters to the church in Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says in verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, and three times I was shipwrecked. And a night and a day I spent in the ocean. Now listen, Paul had experience when it came to sailing and shipwrecks and even spent an entire night and day treading water in the ocean before being rescued. And having been through this near-death experience in his own life, he was seeking to help others avoid the same fate. You see, he was trying to save them from a similar pain and heartache that he had experienced. But it says, you read it there, nevertheless, the centurion, the commander, the ship's captain, they didn't listen to the warning. Why? Well, for one thing, Paul was a tent maker, not a sailor. What did he know? Secondly, Fair Havens was not the most exciting port to spend the winter. Most of the sailors wanted to go to Phoenix, located on the southern end of the shore of Crete, and spend the winter there. Besides, it was only another, listen, it was only another 50 miles distance, only a few hours sail. They would be there. They could make it. Also, the captain was very persuasive. It says that Paul perceived, but the captain persuaded. And so... The commander, the centurion in charge, listen to the captain. Friends, how many times do we see in the Bible the Lord sending messengers to give warnings to his people? Times where God is long-suffering to warn people from destroying their life. I think of the prophet Ezekiel who was told by the Lord, but the house of Israel will not listen to you because it won't listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Like the centurion in the story, we can disregard the warnings of God to keep us out of the storm. And we have all kinds of reasons why we disregard the warnings. We say to ourselves, what do they know? They're not in my situation. They're not a professional counselor. What do you know? Well, that may have happened to you, but it won't happen to me. 
At the core, at the core of disregard for the warnings of God is pride within the heart. We think we're better than that, or we should, or we would never do that, or we're above that, or the passage in the Bible that you're talking about, that doesn't refer to me. That's a dangerous place to be. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Has the Lord been sending you warnings from his servants, people that love you? people that have already walked down that road and found it to be empty, who barely made it back alive, and they're saying to you, stop, trust me, I've lived that story. And I don't want to see it happen to you. That was what Paul was doing. He was saying, turn back. Those who find themselves today in unnecessary storms do not discern the signs. They disregard the warnings, but thirdly, They're deceived into thinking they'll escape the consequences. You'll notice in verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, they put out to sea and they sailed close to Crete, but not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called the Euroclidon. Notice what happened. They board the ship in spite of the warning. They set sail, and lo and behold, how convenient. The south wind blew softly. Look at that. It made them think we made the right decision. Can you imagine? Ha ha, Paul, look there. What do you know? South wind blowing softly. Hello. You don't know anything, Paul. What do you say now, tent maker? We're setting sail. We're on our way. But I want you to notice a word in the text. The word supposing. Very important word. Supposing they had obtained their desire. They assumed that they were in the clear. They were certain that the consequences of disregarding the warnings had been avoided. Listen carefully, friend. The south wind always blows softly In the beginning, we can be deceived so easily and things seem right at the start and the devil knows that. You start thinking like these sailors. I told those haters. I told those doubters. Look at me. I'm still going. I'm still standing. What do they know at that church? They don't know anything. That pastor's clueless and he's also short. I mean, you don't know anything. Living together before we're married, it's not a bad idea. Dating that non-believer, they said it wouldn't be good. Hey, we're still in love and we're doing fine. You said taking that job would stumble my kids? Ha, my kids are good. You said not being in fellowship would affect my walk with the Lord? What do you know? I've been out of fellowship since March and I'm still good. Verse 14, but not long after. Here's a picture of reaping what had been sown, not long after. For some, the not long after may be weeks. For others, it could be months. Sadly, for others, it could be years. Everything that they'd been warned about and disregarded, now it begins to come to pass and you're caught in something that you don't know how to get out of. I'm stuck. And the storm, listen, friend, it intensifies. Oh, it seems like everything's fine. But not long after, everything changes. Suddenly, you begin to reap what it is that you've been sowing to. In verse 14, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called a Euroclidon. And notice this. So when the ship was caught, it was caught and it could not head into the wind. We let her drive. Suddenly, the winds changed. Instead of the southern wind, there was a violent north wind. Historically speaking, the Cretan mountains were located 7,000 feet in elevation, and down from these mountains could come typhonic-type winds. And the winds were called the Euroclidon, and they were so strong, it was said that they could blow a ship right out of the water. And I find these words very descriptive. Do you know what happens? When you don't discern the signs, 
Do you know what happens when you disregard the warnings of God? When you're deceived into thinking that you will escape the consequences, the ship is caught, you're trapped. The ship couldn't go in the direction it wanted to go. It was, listen, out of control. We let her drive the ship. We just, there was no control over the situation. And that's what happens to a life. You're caught in sin, in bondage. You've lost your moral compass. You now have no direction. You're just drifting. But notice what the sailors try to do next in verse 15. And running under the shelter of the island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. And when we had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck the sail and were so driven. Let me tell you what this means. The first thing they do is they try, listen, to adjust their course. We're just going to alter the course. That's all, that's all it is. This is not, it's not what you think it is. We're not out of control. We just need to adjust our course. We run under the shelter, it says, but that wasn't working. But we can get through this. We just need to row harder. We just need to adjust the coordinates. We can handle this. We can get through it. It didn't work. So what did they do next? It says they secured the skiff with difficulty. The skiff was the escape boat that would normally be pulled behind a larger vessel, but they were in danger of losing their potential exit strategy. So we need to bring it on board. We don't want to lose that. And so they sought to secure the skiff. But then it says they attempted to undergird the ship. Do you know what that means? It meant that they would try to tie everything down to make it secure as possible before it broke into pieces. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Are you understanding what I'm saying here? In other words, all of these things reveal what they were doing in their own power to secure what they had and a plan for a potential escape. And how often people do the exact same thing rather than repent and run to the Lord and say, God, I'm turning from my sin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie this down. I got this. I got this. I can hold this together. And things are coming apart. But you know what happens next? great loss. It says in verse 18, and because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day, look at this, they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. What happens? The storm doesn't let up. It only intensifies. And we were, look at this, forced to throw things overboard with our own hands. Folks, valuable supplies, precious commodities are thrown over. Why? I just need to stay afloat. Throw that over, throw that over with their own hands. And this is something that can happen. When you're in a storm because of disobedience, everything's coming apart. And with your own hands, you begin to overthrow things that were so precious and so valuable. Hey, thanks for joining us for A Daily Walk, our Monday edition. Pastor John Rendell's message is called A Storm is Coming and based in Acts 27. If you missed a portion or would just like to hear it again, visit adailywalk.org or request a CD copy for a cost of just $5 by calling toll-free at 877-242-0828. That's 877-242-0828. Did you know you can also listen to Pastor John on your mobile device? Check out the Calvary South OC Church app and look for a daily walk wherever you get your podcasts. We're really excited about this month's offer, a Bible study book written by Pastor John's wife, Michelle Randall. It's titled, Perfected, A Journey Through Proverbs 31. To many women, Proverbs 31 seems to set a standard that's impossible to achieve. They're left feeling defeated and discouraged like they don't measure up. But this doesn't reflect the heart of God the Father for His precious daughters. When viewed through the sanctifying work of Jesus, perfected a journey through Proverbs 31 breathes fresh, truth-filled perspective. This isn't just for wives and moms, but for women of all ages. Get a copy today for the special price of $10 at adailywalk.org or call 877-242-0828. 
When you support a daily walk, you're helping people all over the world hear about the love of Jesus, and many are growing as a result. So thank you for helping us cover the cost of being on the radio. Again, make a donation online safely and securely at adailywalk.org or call us at 877-242-0828. In these difficult days, it is so important that we be praying for one another. So please send in your prayer requests today. Our email address is adailywalk at gmail.com. That's adailywalk at gmail.com. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but we'll pick up where we left off in our Through the Bible journey next time. This has been A Daily Walk with Pastor John Randall, where you'll never have to walk alone. This is a presentation of Calvary South O.C., 